All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program, which is YPO Presents the Old Curtain Aqueduct. And this program is also sponsored by the Yonkers Historical Society. And we're lucky to have Tom Trinowski tonight. And he is a friend of the Old Curtain Aqueduct. Tom worked for a quarter of a century as a photo researcher and a photo editor. And after retirement, he took a temp job researching stories for a magazine, including one story about the history of the New York City water system. This led to the beginning of his almost 20 years of research on the subject, starting with the Manhattan Company. So, Tom, thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to listening to your presentation. Okay. Can I start now? Yeah. Okay. Do you have to admit anybody else for the moment? Yeah, I'll keep checking on the waiting room. Okay. Uh, well, greetings, Pete, folks. Um, you're obviously history buffs, or you wouldn't have signed up for this one. The Old Croton Aqueduct is uh, New York City's first supply of pure and wholesome water, which was delivered to it in the uh, fall of 1842. And that's pretty far back in our own history. Most of us can't even picture what New York City looked like in 1842. We do have a few graphics that we'll show you later on in the presentation. But this first one is a, a uh, architectural rendering um, produced at the time of the plans for the Old Croton Aqueduct. So this probably dates from the 1830s, and it was in an unprocessed collection of architectural drawings at the Library of Congress uh, that I paid them to digitize at, in a high resolution. It is the only drawing of all the architectural drawings uh, for the aqueduct that shows human beings working in it. And in this one, it shows two workers standing on a platform within formwork, that being a wooden frame, as they built the brick arch around the aqueduct tunnel. And all of that is done within a wooden uh, uh, tunnel bracing as they tunneled it through earth to build this particular version of it. And then the next frame, which doesn't show, hold on a second. Here we go. The next frame shows what their efforts look like today in Ossining, New York, where uh, public tours are allowed in the tunnel at the Weir building in Ossining, adjacent to the Ossining Community Center. And so it's a seven and a half feet wide by eight and a half feet high brick lined tunnel, which as designed was only supposed to carry water up to the height of about five feet. Uh, and that would be to the stone reinforced parts uh, on the flat walls before the arch started to curve over. And that would have been enough to deliver about 70 million gallons of water a day to New York City at full capacity. And some variations on the design um, show what it would have looked like built in a trench on the surface or on a raised embankment, which is the middle image and the top row. And those embankments could have been anywhere from a few feet high up to about 55 feet high as the highest one that I know of. And those were necessary to keep the water flowing by gravity alone. Part of the engineering principles of the old Croton Aqueduct were the same as the old Roman aqueducts that delivered water from higher elevations to lower ones by gravity. And the uh, uh, the decline in the uh, Croton Aqueduct was 13 and a half inches per mile. So a very slight incline to keep the water moving downhill, but apparently enough to keep water moving for 41 miles all the way into New York City. Um, other variations on it were the, as tunnel through earth in the uh, arch on the lower left and tunneled through solid rock where the rock ceiling was maintained in some cases uh, if it wasn't necessary to build an entire brick arch. At the very head of the aqueduct, there was a dam. Uh, it actually took two tries to get it right. 
Uh, this one shows two sections with a dividing wall down the middle. The section in the background is from 1843 uh, from a, a book published by a, a city um, engineer. And it's the first section of the dam, which was the only stone section at first. The part with the curved face on it in the foreground was originally an earthen embankment that washed out in a big flood in January of 1841 and had to, rebuild, had to be rebuilt as a stone dam with this innovative curved face on it. There was something new and different for its time. Uh, and that, that design worked very well with a, a wider part of the river covered by a stone dam, it was enough to, uh, to hold back the water and to allow for water to flow over after large storms. By 1955, the original dam had been flooded and, and submerged under 30 feet of water, except for in this photograph, when the water in the New Croton Reservoir was lowered for inspection purposes, it uncovered the old dam again for the first time since um, 1905. And you could see some human figures on the dam in the picture, uh, kind of one at the bottom, a father's kind of sliding down the face of the flat faced section and mom, mom up on top, looking like uh, somebody who was scolding them for being so crazy. And then the curved face of the dam in the background. And uh, somewhat earlier, before 1905, before its submersion under the waters of the New Croton Reservoir, the water going over the dam and showing its curved face very clearly. And this broke the force of the water and didn't put a, an undue burden on the dam during floods. Next, we have the uh, New Croton uh, Dam and um, Hurricane Irene in about the year 2009, I believe, uh, was a huge hurricane that uh, dropped about seven or eight inches of rain over the watershed. And that led to this large uh, kind of Niagara Falls flow over the spillway. Um, the people visiting the dam on the day after the hurricane had to use an umbrella to stay dry, even 100 yards away from the spillway. And a view of the same with a more normal flow in the winter. And a view from the top of the spillway and the top of the dam. Uh, with a rowboat that had broken loose from its mooring somewhere on the reservoir. It holds 30 billion gallons of water. And uh, when they built the New Croton Dam and expanded the reservoir, it increased the amount of water impounded by a factor of 15 from 2 billion gallons behind the original dam to 30 billion gallons of storage behind the New Croton Dam. Uh, and that was okay for a while. But pretty soon after they realized they needed even more dams and more reservoirs in the Croton system. So that by 1910, they had built a total of 12 dams and reservoirs in the Croton system, impounding pretty much every gallon of water that could be uh, saved and stored in the Croton system. The next image is an early water bill from the Croton dam, uh, the water board in August of 1842, shortly after the Croton water was delivered to New York, people who owned their own homes began to hook up to the New York system so they would have clean and fresh water delivered to their homes. <clears throat> and for a, um, a nine month period, according to the dates on this uh, handwritten re receipt, uh, the owner paid $11.25. And that's including for a dwelling and for one bath within that dwelling at 331 Washington Street. And so for uh, a, a, a normal year's use of water in 1842 was $10. So less than a dollar a month, which was still a sizable amount of money back then. Here are some of uh, images of the types of people who would have built the aqueduct. An Irish laborer, um, itinerant laborer, who would have been one of the pick and shovel men doing all the excavation and moving the raw material for the uh, parts of the aqueduct along its 41 mile course from Westchester down to 42nd Street, an early surveyor with a, uh, a fairly sophisticated uh, sighting scope for the time and the other basic tools of his trade, a compass, 
a ruler and some charts. Uh, a stonemason to his left would have been a skilled worker, carving some stones in the aqueduct to more finished shapes and sizes for some of the uh, culverts um, and finished um, uh, buildings that were built on the aqueduct. And on the right side, we see a fireman posing with an early New York City fire hydrant. And we'll give you a better look at him. Uh, this is an accurate re representation of one of the early fire hydrants in New York City. And the fireman's name, according to the New York City Fireman Museum, is James McElroy. His initials are on his helmet. Uh, these photos are from early daguerreotypes. This one is a colored one, hand painted after the fact. Um, the labor force on the aqueduct as of July of 1839 was up to 3,300 men and teams, which means horses and wagons uh, moving materials onto the sites uh, and maybe some of the men too. And uh, you see in by the winter, they had shut down the work so that only 1400 men were still working in December when the, the ground froze and when it wasn't possible uh, to work very accurately or very efficiently in, in the freezing cold. The bottom part of this report in 1839 talks about some of the major components that were under construction at the time, including the Croton Dam, the State Farm Tunnel, which was a, a tunnel in Ossetting, um, the number, uh, the Mill River Embankment uh, Tunnel through White Plains, the Sawmill River Tunnel, embankments for the Sawmill River in Yonkers, and the Tibbetts Brook Tunnel, uh, all of which were under construction at the time, as well as har uh, foundations for the Harlem River Bridge, the Jumel Tunnel, which was a, a rock tunneled section in Highbridge, in Manhattan, uh, the Manhattan Hill Tunnel, Clendenning Overpass Bridge, the receiving and distributing reservoirs, all major components of the, of the um, aqueduct at the time. Uh, I like this quote from the 1839 meeting or one of the 1839 meetings of the Board of Aldermen and it's about immigration, uh, something we're still debating today in which there's about, there's a lot of argument about letting new immigrants into the country. The Alderman meeting in 1839 says that in a country so vast, of so vast an extent and so abundant in resources as the United States, when all who are willing to labor can find employment in the various works, both of public and private enterprise constantly in progress, the, the continued increase of population by emigration is not to be regretted. And I think we'll find people on both sides of that argument today, as, as they did in 1839, when there was a, uh, a movement to keep people from coming into the country as well. But it goes on to say in the, in the minutes, to the oppressed of all nations, this country has ever extended the offer of a ref refuge from persecution. And it's the same reason people are coming here today. And though they have, there have been instances when the laws of the land have been evaded, evaded for purposes of profit, yet the great body of immigrants have added to the public wealth. And there is within our land ample room for all who are willing to labor. So I think this echoes a lot of the same arguments that we, we hear today. And I think it was, I thought it was worth seeing from the opinions of New York citizens as far back as 1839. Uh, in Ossining, there is a uh, aqueduct bridge that carries the aqueduct in that upper structure with a large arch over a small gorge. It's deep, but uh, of an insignificant waterway at most at most times of the day of the year, except for when there's a storm, when the the uh, Sing Sing Kill, which is the small body, the small stream of water in the bottom, can fill up to five or six feet deep, and there's a road bridge that crosses under that aqueduct. And here's an architectural drawing from the 1830s, a plan of that arch as it would have been built using heavy um, wooden bracing and framework, a formwork they called it, uh, to mount the stones of the arch over it. And a little bit of a cutaway on the left showing hollow spaces uh, on either side of the arch 
that were an innovative building technique at the time to allow the structure to be built with less weight, uh, but with just as much strength. It was all stonework with stone cross bracing through the hollow spaces. Another, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, a lot of the aqueduct was built on embankments that had to be raised to keep the uh, decline of the aqueduct at a steady 13 and a half inches per mile. And when the aqueduct crossed valleys, the, aque the aqueduct embankment walls had to be raised anywhere from a few feet up to about 55 feet. And here's one that shows a 40 foot wall with the aqueduct built on top of it <clears throat> and enormous amounts of rubble and earth embanked on either side of it uh, to hold the structure in, in place. Oh, I just killed a mosquito on my screen. They're still around. <laughs> At any rate, this architectural drawing is also from the Jervis Library. And here's a real life image of what that would have looked like uh, during the um, uh, modification of part of the aqueduct in the Bronx in 1896. After the, after the New Croton Aqueduct had opened, delivering three times as much water to the city, uh, the city was able to shut down the old aqueduct to build a road culvert through the, the original embankment for the Croton Aqueduct in the Bronx. And this became Burnside Avenue at the time. Another uh, standard component on the aqueduct whoops, was a ventilator tower. And there were uh, a ventilator towers placed about one mile away from each other along most of the aqueduct. This is a fancy one in Ossining. And the uh, contractor thought so much of it that he carved his own name into it. Uh, on section 22, T.J. Carmichael, contractor, uh, and the date 1840 uh, for this section of aqueduct that was built in Ossining. The ventilators basically let air in and out of the aqueduct. If the water level being delivered to the city rose or fell, they needed uh, openings in it to let air in or out of the aqueduct to maintain the air pressure in the aqueduct so it wouldn't damage the unpressurized tunnel uh, by forcing too much air into it. And here's a more normal ventilator tower up in the northern sections of the aqueduct uh, up in uh, Cortland. Other sections were cut through rock cuts. And this one, the aqueduct tunnel is right below the path. And you can see the amount of rock that was cut away and dug into a deep trench uh, to build the aqueduct. There are also weir buildings. This one is at Pocantigo. Uh, adjacent to the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery and the Pocantico Preserve, or the Rockefeller Preserve, as you might know it. And this one is in pretty good shape, having been renovated, I believe, a wintertime photograph. The weirs were buildings that allowed water to be emptied from the aqueduct for maintenance and repair purposes. And there were valves in each one that could be opened to let the water in the aqueduct out into local streams and rivers. That's the way it was supposed to work. Uh, here's a road culvert in Irvington uh, in Westchester, uh, the way it looks like today and the way it looked in 1842. There was a stream culvert right next to it. So there was a, 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 a stream culvert that allowed water under the aqueduct and the road culvert big enough for one wagon and horse. Um, I'd, I'd love to stage a, a new photograph um, like the previous one and put people in top hats and long tailcoats, see if we could make it look like an antique photograph. And a little bit of close up work uh, of that stonework uh, showing some of the uh, fairly intricate stonework on that uh, road culvert in Irvington. As we make our way south from Irvington, we end up in Yonkers and here's the way it might've looked like from up on a steep hill or a high hill in Yonkers in the 1850s. Uh, the group of people give you a clue as to what era of history that is. The road, <clears throat> the road down below looks like it is probably Broadway given the height of the elevation. And then below that would have been Warburton Avenue and just above Warburton would have been the aqueduct, possibly uh, behind the houses that you see in that, in that road down there and the, and the palisades beyond. 
At, at this point in the 1850s, of course, Yonkers was already <clears throat> a fairly large town. Um, it had industries and mills using many of the uh, uh, water powered mills along the Sawmill River uh, for timber, timber mills and other manufacturing purposes. And here's a view on the aqueduct trail today in Yonkers, uh, just south of Hastings, where you get a similar view from the aqueduct trail itself out over the Hudson River. And um, this is the most northern part of Yonkers and probably the least citified. And as we get down towards uh, the Glenwood train station, uphill from that, we find the Weir building in Yonkers. And you can see the people walking on the aqueduct trail at the top of a steep, uh, steep hillside that drops off very steeply. <clears throat> Most of the aqueduct was built on ridge lines uh, as they were surveyed out and uh, kind of tucked into the hillsides in many cases. This one is a description of entering the Yonkers Valley. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, talking about arriving in Yonkers um, through after passing some small valleys and creeks uh, and in Yonkers where there is a very formidable work executed at tunneling. And they're talking here about the Sawmill River uh, and the um, culverts built in to allow the Sawmill River to pass under the aqueduct. And they talk about two rock tunnels, one 684 feet long and the other 810 feet. Um, the Sawmill River Tunnel is where Rumsey Road would be now, kind of adjacent to the Cross County Parkway. And the Sawmill River Tunnel, or the Tibbetts Brook Tunnel, sorry, is in the, in the vicinity of Yonkers Avenue um, and Tibbetts Brook Park, where um, Tibbetts Brook crosses under Yonkers Avenue. It would have crossed under the aqueduct itself at that point in a 10 foot wide stream culvert and then, uh, as you know, Tibbetts Brook continues down through Tibbetts Brook Park uh, with the aqueduct uh, along Midland Avenue. Um, some of the embankments for Tibbetts Brook had to be uh, built uh, 27 to 40 feet high uh, for the culvert uh, for the culverts to um, carry the water. Here on the upper two photos is an architectural drawing of one of the culvert tunnels on the Sawmill River with the aqueduct on top of it. And you can see it was a double culvert with the sawmill river on the right and a road culvert on the left, allowing the horses and wagons that were the common conveyances at the time to pass through. Um, and the two drawings, the drawing on the bottom is a picture for a standard culvert of four to six feet in width. And uh, what that would have looked like in a drawing from the 1830s with a photograph of what one of those culverts looks like today in Briarcliff. So even though these culverts were built 175 years ago, many of them still do the job that they were built for and direct streams under the aqueduct just as they were designed to do 175 years ago. Here's a close up view of the Nepperhan crossing. The Sawmill River used to be called the Nepperhan as well. Uh, one of these two culverts is now sealed up and the road culvert for the wet horses and wagons has been enlarged to allow larger vehicles and two-way traffic. And we'll see that in this photograph shows Yonkers in the 1890s with the original design of the culvert still intact. And you can see the city of Yonkers building up behind it, some of the mills and some of the housing that was being built at that point as Yonkers grew into its industrial era. And then in the 1970s, uh, we see an aerial view that one of the culverts has been filled up and part of the channel of the sawmill has been filled in uh, in landfill. And that small road tunnel is now doubly, doubly wide. Um, some of you might recognize the Polish hall in the background on the left-hand photograph and some of the uh, current buildings that you might see there today. Now, in this next photograph, this next graphic, I want your help, you Yonkers folks, in identifying a keeper's house that I think might still exist in Yonkers. This is a map of the entire route of the aqueduct from the Croton Dam 
down along the uh, ridge over the Hudson River, down into where it says Yonkers KH, which means Keeper's House. There is a building there today among the six that were uh, constructed. I think this may be the third one that we know still exists. The two others, one in Ossining and one in Dobbs Ferry uh, are still existent. And uh, the one in Ossining has been moved off the trail. And I think the one in, Keep in Yonkers has been moved off the trail as well. It was right built on over the aqueduct originally. And here's the design of the keeper's house, uh, like the one in Dobbs Ferry that we have renovated. And here's the one that I think might be the keeper's house in Yonkers on Grove Street near the intersection of Glenwood. Um, I believe this may be the keeper's house based on other information, such as the building is now right above the old Croton Aqueduct Trail, whose designation you can see in that tree line north to south. And it's just uh, to uphill from the Nepperhan Community Center at the corner of Grove and Glenwood. And this would put it just off the trail from where I think it might have been in the past. And this map from the 1880s tells us the same thing. On the aqueduct, that diagonal wide, 66 foot wide path, there is a, a brick house with a wooden porch on the trail next to an empty spot where it could easily have been moved. So if any of, of you have your secret historical sources, please let Michael and I know that you can prove that that is the keeper's house on Grove Street. It will solve the big mystery. Um, here is a, a map uh, from the 1890s or early 1900s showing the Croton Aqueduct going from east to west in Yonkers, which is what it does after Ashburton Avenue, um, where it turns off the Hudson River route about Lamartine and makes a, a, a turn across uh, Ashburton and Yonkers Avenue. You can see hints of the aqueduct under Yonkers Avenue. And this would have been in, in the area where Rumsey Road and the Cross County Parkway are now. Over on the right side of the map, you can see it curving across Tippett's Brook and then curving south again into Tippett's Brook Park and along Midland Avenue. And then we'll do one more map a little bit later. Uh, this is turned on its side, but Yonkers Avenue in this, in this map turned 90 degrees is going from the top to the bottom. And you can see the word aqueduct just below the word Yonkers on that white road. You can also see uh, the New York Central Railroad's Putnam line as it crossed uh, Yonkers Avenue at the Dunwoody station, which is still there on an elevated structure. And you drive under a little bridge on Yonkers Avenue today, just adjacent to the aqueduct. This map actually shows two aqueducts. The old aqueduct where it curves, and you can see the word Croton a little bit to the left of uh, left side of the image. And there's a dotted line going left to right, which is the right of way of the new Croton aqueduct, uh, which also crosses in the same general area and comes very close to the old aqueduct. And of course, the Dunwoody uh, golf course is what we know today. Um, I believe there may have been another institution there in the past. And of course, the tracks for the Putnam Railroad are now the South County Bike Trail, which you can take all the way up to Brewster, New York, if you want to bike 50 miles. Also within Tibbetts Brook Park, the uh, New York State Parks, which now owns the aqueduct and the trail, uh, did some renovations on the foundation walls where there were raised embankments. This is seven or eight years ago. And it shows modern stonemasons pounding heavy stones into place to rebuild a collapsed part of the wall. And you can see the standard uh, embankment wall in the background that enclosed the aqueduct. Uh, they, have, they had the use of modern equipment, however. They didn't have to list it, lift these heavy stones with a winch, a hand-driven winch, or uh, steam engines that might have been utilized in the earlier days. You can also see that they used heavier stonework than was used in the old embankment behind them, where much smaller stones were used uh, to enclose the embankment of the aqueduct. 
as we move south on the aqueduct, we enter the Bronx, and most of the route in the Bronx is on a level ridge line here in a photograph under a mounded earth for about a distance of two miles from about Kingsbridge Road on Aqueduct Avenue down to Highbridge um, with a uh, telephone poles mounted above it. And you can see the telltale signs of human pathway. Uh, people use the aqueduct for a trail even then. And in the very background, very small, you can see what was then an existing ventilator tower on the aqueduct in the Bronx. And that path works its way down to Highbridge in the, what was then still Westchester, uh, but became part of the Bronx in 1896, along with Brooklyn, I believe, at the same time. And these are some architectural plans for the High Bridge, which still crosses the Harlem River. There were, I uh, believe, 15 arches. Uh, this is an early plan because it shows four different sizes of arch, and they ended up building only two sizes of arch. They did not build 50 or 60 foot arches, only 50 and 80 foot wide ones, which I think was a cost, a cost saving measure by the chief engineer uh, so that he wouldn't have to build form work uh, over the foundations to build four different size arches. And I'm sure he saved thousands of dollars just reusing the different forms for each arch that was constructed, taking them apart and putting them back together again to build the 50 and 80 foot arches across the river. And here's a slightly different view of it, showing the two 36 inch pipes on the top of the high bridge, which delivered all the water to New York City through the Croton Aqueduct. So two 36 inch water mains today would be probably about the size of a normal water main in any street in New York City. But in 1842, it was enough to supply the entire city, a population of about 330,000 people with all the water that it could use originally. Uh, that changed very quickly as the city grew. Uh, but while they were building the aqueduct, this is a view by F.B. Tower in his book, Illustrations of the Croton Aqueduct in 1843, showing a fountain uh, in the, in the, on the site <clears throat> while the high bridge was being constructed. They had a uh, siphon pipes crossing the river on a temporary embankment. And when they were testing the water and the soundness of the pipes, they could jet water up 100 feet high. And that's what that white column in the background represents, is a 100 foot high fountain shooting up from the, from the uh, surface of the Harlem River at the time. And you can see the bucolic nature of the Bronx on the right and on the left of Manhattan in the upper elevations of Washington Heights as well. The house on the left is the Jumel Mansion dating from the Revolutionary War. And it's still there today. I believe it's owned by the city. Um, you can visit it today and uh, hear the history of the mansion during the Revolutionary War. The next text block is from a, a nine-year-old girl's diary uh, that she wrote in 1855, talking about how her father took her family and her uh, after hiring a, a stable and a, a horse and carriage out to see the high bridge once it was complete. And she described it as being beautiful, being built with beautiful arches and brings the Croton water to New York. My brother, her older brother, says he remembers riding to the place where the Croton Aqueduct crossed the Harlem River by a siphon before the bridge was built. And the man who took charge of it opened a jet at the lowest point and sent a two inch stream up a hundred feet. And that was that illustration that we looked at just previously. And then her mother also told her about the history of water in Manhattan, which when she was young, everybody drank the Manhattan water. And what that means is water from the Manhattan Company, which had an exclusive charter from the state to be the only supplier of water to New York City because they promised to deliver clean water to it in 1799, something that they never did. They only uh, dug more wells and built a, a small reservoir on Chambers Street in Lower Manhattan and then installed hollowed out wooden logs 
used as water mains connected end to end uh, to uh, people's houses and to pumps on the street. Uh, and the water was, everybody had a cistern in their backyard for washing. And uh, that would have been collecting rainwater from their roofs piped into a, a, you know, a stone or wooden tank in their backyards. And when this girl, little girl's mother lived in Maiden Lane, she was a, 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 rich, a little rich kid whose father was a wealthy merchant and they had servants who had to go up to the corner of Broadway and get the drinking water from the pump there. And that would have been the Manhattan, the Manhattan water pump. And then I will skip over a little bit of this about her father being the first one to get water, Manhattan water delivered to his house through a tap. Her mother says the Manhattan water was brackish and not very pleasant to drink. And it was less than pleasant, it could actually kill you. Uh, there were cholera epidemics after the early 1830s that killed thousands of people at a time. Um, that she also mentions Canal Street and that her grandfather had ships that went to Holland <coughs> And he brought back ice skates from Holland for his children who could skate on the canal that is now Canal Street and on the pond that is now Foley Square. So think of Manhattan as a uh, having a large pond on it and think of Canal Street as, a, as an open channel uh, draining water into the Hudson River. Pretty extraordinary when you think about it. Here's a letter from one of the um, engineers who will, worked building the Croton Aqueduct. And this is Peter Hasty, a Scottish immigrant who had been in America from the 1830s uh, had, and had lived through the cholera epidemic of 1832. Um, he then went to work for an engineer named John V. Jervis, later hired to be the chief engineer on the Croton Aqueduct. And Peter Hasty talks about his work uh, working for Jervis as one of the resident engineers uh, in which employment he has continued. The aqueduct, and he describes it fairly accurately here, the entire length of it upwards of 40 miles and divided into four residencies or divisions. And Hasty's division was the forest division or that from the Harlem uh, River where they were building the high bridge uh, down into Manhattan, embracing by far the heaviest and most important part of the work. Uh, this, of course, he esteems an honor. The uh, engineers, my associates, chiefs, and assistants are better men than I can reasonably hope to be employed again with, uh, be again employed with. The grammar and the sentence structure is, is worth the price of admission itself. I have one more letter later on that you'll enjoy too, which is even uh, much more flowery and poetic. Now, and again, he... Uh, Hasty refers to the Industrial Revolution taking hold here by the reference to steamships. The communication between Britain and America is now by means of steamships in 1841, frequent and rapid. And he then promises to write letters to his family after that. I'm not sure he ever did. And here's a view of the Harlem River uh, in the 1850s once the high bridge had been completed. You can see it in the background. Uh, the bridge in the foreground is a small stone bridge, uh, which possibly opened in the, in the center of it to allow small boats through. But it was just a small stone piers across the Harlem River. And it, it, today is the site of the Macombs Dam Bridge on 155th Street um, in the vicinity of Yankee Stadium on the Bronx side, which would be the far side of the river here. And the men in the rowboats are off the shore on the Manhattan side of the high bridge. And is still in his bucolic uh, kind of country setting in the 1850s. That didn't last for long though. By the 1860s, the high bridge was opened up, the, the top was removed and the two 36 inch pipes that had delivered all the water to New York were augmented by a 90 inch wrought iron pipe here shown under construction uh, and they had to build the sides of the high bridge up another eight or nine feet to again cover over this pipe once the pipe was installed. Uh, just by way of information, the contractor who built this pipe 
was the same contractor who then went back to Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and built the Monitor ironclad warship for the Civil War uh, shortly after this 1861 job in New York City. And then later on in the uh, early 1900s, the um, aqueduct across the river was still intact, showing all of its arches. The bridge in the foreground with the big steel arch is the Washington Bridge that was completed by 1890 uh, as a road bridge connecting Westchester or what was about what had become the Bronx to Manhattan. And on the right side, you can see the natural shoreline of Manhattan before the Harlem River Drive was built uh, or before the speedway that preceded it was built. But we'll show you some of that. Uh, this is the same shoreline looking north instead of south, uh, again, under the Manhattan Bridge and with the speedway with its horses and carriages which were built for people uh, who wanted a place to race their fancy horses and carriages in the 1890s and early 1900s. <clears throat> the stone building on the upper left is actually a pump house or a gatehouse for the New Croton Aqueduct, which crosses under the Harlem River here uh, and was tunneled under the Harlem River by 1890. And that was the new aqueduct that delivered larger amounts of water to New York under greater pressure. Uh, one of the things you can notice, uh, the lady in the foreground in the carriage on the speedway, there's a, a woman driver of the horse and carriage, which is something you probably didn't see then. It may have been frowned on socially at the time, but <clears throat> there's a woman out there doing it nevertheless, kind of flouting customs and taking her own horse and carriage out on the speedway. Oh, one more. And by the 1920s, the lid was taken off the high bridge once more and uncovered the 90 inch pipe that had been put on there in 1860. And in this case, they were doing it to remove sections of the aqueduct uh, and the stone arches to replace five of them with a one large steel arch across the Harlem River. And you can see that the bucolic nature of the Bronx in the background has been replaced by, nine, in nine, by 1927 with an urbanized environment of five and six story apartment houses up on Aqueduct Avenue and Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx, if some of you might know that. And here's a little bit more of the demolition of the high bridge arches, looking very much in the way that they probably looked when they were being demolished years before with the formwork underneath them to support the stonework as they demolished the arches. But by 1927, they had steam engine driven cranes and a sliding track and a sliding crane that slid back and forth on railroad tracks across the five arches that were being demolished. And here's the steel arch going in, probably in the spring of 1928. And um, we'll get to a, another image in a minute. But first, I wanted to show you how the uh, Croton Aqueduct and the High Bridge in particular were part of the public consciousness in the early 1900s, so much so that the Aqueduct and the High Bridge appeared uh, as the backdrop in a Broadway play called Fallen Among Thieves. <clears throat> a plucky girl dives from its sky towering summit to save another woman from drowning. And this would have been a woman uh, on the stage on Broadway diving from a platform representing the high bridge into a tank of water, probably with a drowning actress on the stage. And you can see the Snidely Whiplash character on the left side skulking away, probably after throwing the woman into the river. Um, if you can find any other references for this play, any of you theater buffs out there, please let me know. This is the only reference I've ever seen to this play. And then later on, or now, we can see that steel arched bridge built in 1927 crossing the Harlem River and the now renovated high bridge with its remaining arches from the Bronx side and what it looks like today with the high bridge water tower in the background, which was built in the 1870s to supply water pressure to the higher elevations of Manhattan that were a little too elevated for the Croton Aqueduct to supply water under any pressure. There's a celebration of the uh, high bridge when it was first reopened. 
I like to call it the uptown version of the High Line. Not quite as chic, but pretty damn nice and a gorgeous view from the top down the Harlem River uh, to lower Manhattan, down to the skylines of Manhattan. Uh, some of the old ornamental ironwork that still exists on the high bridge. And a view as you go farther south of the Clendenning Valley uh, embankments and wall that uh, were built between 105th and 98th Street, just to the west of Columbus Avenue, or what became Columbus Avenue. When the aqueduct was first built, there were no laid out streets that far uptown. Uh, and so they had to build, as planning for the future, uh, road culverts and pedestrian culverts to cross under the aqueduct for streets that had not yet been built. However, by 1870, the city had grown so quickly that the Glendinning Valley arches were demolished in favor of putting the aqueduct uh, in iron pipes uh, so that real estate investors and developers uh, could build, build their uh, apartment houses and you know, for the growing neighborhoods of New York City as the city grew further uptown. So these cows were soon displaced by people as the streets were built and, and buildings were built in. As we get down to Central Park where the aqueduct, the brick structure of the aqueduct actually ends, we find this rectangular reservoir, the old reservoir in this 1860 map uh, next to the new reservoir uh, that we know there today, originally called Lake Manahatta, uh, now called Lake Onassis. The rectangular reservoir was emptied in the 1920s and filled in to become the Great Lawn of Central Park. And that's where they have all the concerts in the park now. Uh, here's what it would have looked like had they not built Central Park. <clears throat> all the surrounding streets between Fifth Avenue and Eighth Avenue would have been built right up to the receiving reservoir. Uh, but instead of that happening, all this land was used by the city to build Central Park. So everything between Fifth and Eighth in this image um, shown between 86th Street down to about 72nd would have been built in with houses um, and, and structures for, for dwellings rather than becoming the um, iconic Central Park that we have today. And here's a view uh, of in 1924 of the receiving reservoir before it was emptied. On the right side, you can see Belvedere Castle which still exists next to one small remnant. Uh, it's now known as the Turtle Pond, the only watery remnant of the old reservoir. And in 1933, an aerial photograph was taken. Whoops, sorry about that. Showing the emptied reservoir and with the newly built skyscrapers of Midtown in the background. And as we make our way down to 42nd Street, uh, through the metal pipes that were installed on Fifth Avenue from the receiving reservoir down to 42nd, we come to the uh, distribution reservoir, which has a fancy curved cornice on it <clears throat> that was not originally planned. But here's another text block describing water first entering it in 1842. Uh, the Croton engineer, Fayette Bartholomew Tower, who is also the author of illustrations of the Croton Aqueduct describing water being led into the 42 Street Distributing Reservoir on July 4th for the first time. And now keep in mind that he's writing this letter to his girlfriend and it may, it may explain the poetic language that he used. At an hour when the morning guns had aroused but few from their dreamy slumbers and ere yet the rays of the sun had gilded the city domes I stood upon the topmost wall of this reservoir and saw the first gush of the waters as they entered the bottom and wandered about as if each particle had consciousness and would choose for itself a resting place in this palace towards which it had made a pilgrimage. Or I fancied I could recognize the water nymphs of the Croton come from their rugged caverns to enjoy the refinements of a city residence. Now, that isn't a poetic description. I don't know what is. And here's an architectural plan for the fancy cornice on the reservoir. At the bottom and in the middle, there's an estimate 
comparing the cost of the two cornices. And this one says, say about $10,000. And that would have been for about 1,600 feet, linear feet of cornice uh, built around all four sides of the top of that reservoir. But the plan was changed from the plain square cut uh, cornice had, that had originally been planned to the fancier, what they called an Egyptian cornice, because they understood at that point that the reservoir was going to be an ornament in the middle of the city and something that New Yorkers would visit for many years to come. Not as many as they thought, but <clears throat> here's the uh, frontage of the aqueduct from two, two views, one on 42nd Street and one on Fifth Avenue, showing these big openings where the uh, water pipes underneath would have entered on 42nd and the bottom one would have been the Fifth Avenue entrance, um, shown with really no buildings around or very few structures, uh, the reservoir being built on a hill on 42nd Street between 42nd and 40th at a time when there were very few buildings in that part of Manhattan. And that's true for this illustration as well, uh, which shows people up on the top of the distributing reservoir promenading around it and being able to see views in all directions from that great 40 foot height at, at Murray's Hill. The people walking in the foreground are, are on Fifth Avenue, which probably had been dug up to install the water pipes from the reservoir uptown. And those mountains of excavation are probably what was left over once the water pipes were installed. So the street here, Fifth Avenue was not even paved at this point. And a few new buildings and smaller buildings are seen just growing up near it and around it. But not more than 10 or 15 years later, the city had grown up around the distributing reservoir. And you see very few open lots left up to 42nd Street. As you look down in this aerial view down towards the battery, uh, on the left is Brooklyn, on the right is New Jersey, and in the, in the long distance would be Staten Island. The uh, kind of metal and glass structure you see built next to the reservoir was called the Crystal Palace. It was an exhibition hall built in the 1850s, uh, which burned down only after three or four years when its contents caught fire and destroyed the entire structure, uh, giving rise to what we today know as Bryant Park. And then looking at another view of Lower Manhattan, Union Square Park, which was then in, encased in a big oval uh, with an iron fence around it. And at the top of that oval is 14th Street, looking down uh, to the Battery of Manhattan. And you can see how busy the harbor might have been with sailing ships. And one reason it was such a successful city was that it became a center of trade after the Erie Canal was built and after the Croton water supply was delivered, two hydraulic projects that made the city grow beyond its bounds and beyond its own normal supply of water. And the fact there was a fountain in City Hall Park as well. Uh, there's another one there now, but this is a drawing of the original. Uh, going back to our keeper's house in Dobbs Ferry, I wanted to show you a little bit about what it looked like before we reno re renovated an interior uh, view of the staircase minus its railing and with all the clump, crumbling plaster on the walls and ceilings, which had been crumbling since the 1960s, uh, finally gave way when we rent, renovated the building uh, to the rebuilt staircase and a new newel post uh, for which we found a model in the Ossining Keeper's house. And then a, a, woodwork, a skilled woodworker copied the newel post at the bottom of the staircase uh, when the house was renovated. Um, which we also celebrated and which we now have exhibits mounted, some of which you've seen in this slideshow, but there is currently an exhibit still at the Keeper's House uh, with more photos than you've seen here, architectural drawings, photos, um, and, uh, and illustrations. And one thing that some of you might like is to continue your own research you could take a screen grab now if, you're, if your computer allows it for the Fayette Bartholomew Tower book, Illustrations of the Croton Aqueduct, uh, Theophilus Schramke's description of the new Croton Aqueduct a few years later. 
and a book by Edward Wegman in 1896 called The Water Supply of New York City, uh, kind of a, a seminal bo book up to about 1896, describing all the water supply and the history of New York. And those three previous citations can all be found on digital libraries. For those of you to, who care to look at archive.org or at hathitrust.org, where you can um, download or at least read online the entire uh, volumes of those three books. And there are others as well. One good recent history is Water for Gotham by Gerard Capel, an excellent historian uh, who published a 2000 book, uh, excellent and well-written recent history of the pre-Croton era to the Croton Aqueduct era. And there are other books as well, including one published by the Hudson River Museum. And it's the uh, Old Croton Aqueduct, Rural Resources Meet Urban Needs. And this is from a show that they had at the museum in, the, in 2000 uh, that was an excellent show. Sorry, I didn't make it, but I did get a copy of the, of the volume. Um, I don't know if the uh, museum still has copies, but they did give us a box or two uh, when they were cleaning out their uh, storage shelves a couple of years ago. And I think you can pick up a copy at the Keeper's House in Dobbs Ferry on the weekend when we have the house open for visitors. And another of the early books was the FB Tower book, Illustrations of the Croton Aqueduct. And, and this uh, is his title page or his cover page showing the city hall fountain as it existed in 1843. And then the next photograph shows some nut lying in the street, getting close to his Croton Aqueduct water research. Um, my friends and some people always told me I might end up in the gutter. And I guess it was true because there I am. <laughs> we can open it up for uh, questions now, Michael, if you like. That, that's the end of the slideshow. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, yeah, so you can unmute yourself, everyone, if you have any questions. Well, uh, I have a question, please. Sure. Go uh, ahead, Tom. Please. Tom, that was just fascinating. Uh, I'm, I give historical walking tours of Rockwood Hall, a section of Rockefeller State Park. So I'm oh, terrific. In, uh, in this. I have two questions that are related, <clears throat> excuse me, because they both involve the technicalities of getting water at elevation down to New York City. And yep. the first question is, is it correct to say that the water flows unimpeded right up to maybe the fourth or fifth floor of buildings in Manhattan, or is there some kind of um, uh, filtration structure going on? And the related question is those two water towers, one in Highbridge Park and the other one at the Yonkers train station, I know that they are there to supply a boost to the water for areas that became populated uh, unexpectedly but are there pumps in those towers? Otherwise, are you talking about are you talking about modern modern towers? I'm talking about both them uh, back in back in the old days, and also as they exist now uh, in their modern form. And the same question with regard to the gravity fed system was yeah, gravity the original. Remains the same. I I think I can answer at least part of your question. The original water pressure in the Croton system. Once it went into the distribution pipes in Lower Manhattan, having come from the hill on 42nd Street from the distributing reservoir, did have enough pressure in it to raise water by its own pressure up to the top of a, a five-story building, which was as high as any residential building was in Manhattan in 1842. Uh, there might have been higher buildings and people, but they were probably warehouses and factories that did not necessarily need plumbing. Uh, when the new Croton Aqueduct was built by 1890, it did increase the water pressure so that water could be uh, raised on its own pressure in the, in the water mains, uh, eight or nine floors. And if anything above that, I think, would have required pumps in the basement. Um, and, but all that became uh, easily possible by the 1890s. Um, you know, as they became taller and taller buildings, they also had elevators. Uh, run by steam engines in some case, uh, some early cases, and then um, 
by electricity after that. So in the very tallest buildings today, pumps are needed to pump water up to the building's uh, roofs, many of which um, you might recognize the iconic wooden water towers on New York City buildings for buildings that are 10 to 20 stories high. And those wooden water towers uh, were probably built in beginning in the late 1800s. And they're still used today uh, to pump water up to the roof of those buildings so that there's water pressure that can come down into the buildings and all the apartments below them. The modern infrastructure of water towers that you see pretty much everywhere uh, probably all use pumps uh, to pump water up into those water towers, creating water pressure in the local area. And that's what the High Bridge Tower was about at the High Bridge as well. Uh, as early as 1870s, they had a steam engine um, pumping water up to a giant tank in the top of that tower uh, at an elevation high enough to create pressure in the upper elevations of Manhattan, which were six or eight stories above the level of the aqueduct at the time. Uh, hey, Tom, Tom, I apologize if I missed it at the beginning, but is there any record of slave labor being used on any part of the construction? On the aqueduct? No, we yeah. don't. We barely have any record of who the workers were other than they hired, other than the fact that they hired uh, immigrants from Ireland to work for about a dollar a day. And in mm -hmm. some cases, after an economic 